Hi, and welcome to the talk. We're going to be talking about Horizon, past and future. So my name is Eric, Eric Saunders. I work for the Stellar Development Foundation. I'm a director of engineering here, where I look after the Horizon project. I'm also in charge of the team of talented engineers who make all of this happen. So today we're going to be talking about Horizon. We're going to briefly cover the role that Horizon plays. We're going to um, describe the winding path that we've taken to get here, the history of how we got here. And then we're going to look at some of the exciting ideas that we're considering next as we look to the future for Horizon. OK, so let's talk about what Horizon is and what it does for the world. As you know, the Stellar network is implemented by Stellar Core. Stellar Core is what makes the Stellar blockchain happen. Instances of Stellar Core run all across the world, and they're connected in a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network. This is the backbone of the Stellar network. This is the thing that makes Stellar real. Horizon is the gateway to that network. Horizon provides a straightforward API that allows developers to build systems that can talk to Stellar. Uh, most importantly, Horizon also builds and stores a historical representation of the blockchain's data that goes back as far as you like. This allows developers to ask questions about what happened in the past and how they happened. So for example, let's say that you're interested in an account balance. Horizon can tell you the balance of the account today but it can also tell you when the payments came in in the past, when they left the account, and where they came from and where they went to. All of this is value that Horizon adds on top of uh, what you would get from talking directly to Stellar Core. So long before the time of Mark Zuckerberg's Horizon-themed metaverse, Stellar had Horizon. In fact, Horizon, the first version of Horizon was produced in 2015, a long, long time ago, in blockchain time. And Horizon has rolled along through many minor versions since then, from 2015 to 2020, when we had the first major release, Horizon 1.0. At the point that we released Horizon 1, we felt that Horizon was finally stable, but there was still plenty to do. A year later, Horizon 2 changed the game for full history operators. And now we're working towards Horizon 3. So, Let's zoom in a bit on this trajectory that we've taken and talk about these releases in more detail. Okay, so what was Horizon 1 all about? Horizon 1 was the ingestion release. Under the hood, the big thing that happened was that we rebuilt from scratch the way that Horizon taught to Stellar Core. And although there wasn't much to see on the surface, the work was similar in scale to changing the engine on a plane while continuing to fly the plane. These were major renovations. So why did we do this? Well, there were three big wins from cleaning up ingestion. The first thing is we took all the heavy lifting that Horizon did and we put it out into a standalone library. So this is the communication with Stellar Core, uh, listening to the stuff that's happening on the blockchain, translating the metadata, the XDR serialized data that such Stellar Core produces, and then uh, feeding it back out into the world to be used by people. Now all of that is in a standalone library. What that means is that now anyone could easily build a new door to the blockchain using exactly the same heavily tested and performant blockchain ingestion code as Horizon itself. So this is a huge step towards uh, moving away from a single gateway. The second big thing that we did was we fixed a big architectural headache, the dependency of Horizon on Stellar Core's database. So before we did this, in order to find out about the current state of the world, Horizon needs to converse with its friend Stellar Core. And before we did this, uh, it's like the software equivalent of rifling through your friend's drinks cabinet, looking for your rare 16-year-old Lagavulin. We were just digging around in this database looking for the, the, the things that Horizon needed. After we finished this rework, it's more like Horizon asking politely if it can have a drink instead and then taking whatever is offered. So this is a much cleaner interface, Stellar Core and Horizon decoupled, Horizon uh, asking politely for data. The third benefit was a really cool side effect of the rebuild. There are a lot of interesting questions that the community had been asking for answers to for a long time that we couldn't answer before. 
But now that we've done this improvement, Horizon could answer them. So now after this rework, we can answer questions like, what is the set of accounts that are authorized to receive my asset? That question is important to a lot of users, but it was the kind of thing that was impossible for us to answer before because we just didn't have that data. So the other thing about Horizon 1 was that we put a lot of work into testing, including byte-for-byte -byte comparisons of ingestion and endpoint behavior between releases. We really, really tried to lock down the testing and make Horizon as reliable as we could. There were also a lot of performance improvements that we put together into this version. The most notable one was very fast pathfinding between assets for path payment operations. So path payments are when you can translate one kind of uh, asset to another on a Stellar network. And there are many ways to go through intermediate assets to find that translation. Horizon provides an endpoint that gives you uh, an optimum solution for that, but that endpoint used to be very slow. We improved it a lot by moving it into memory and improving the graphing algorithms that we used. So overall, at this point, this was the release where we felt the API had matured to the point where we could say, this is stable. We can release this cleanly and regularly every three weeks, actually. And we can really work to minimize breaking changes going forward because we have a mature product. Uh, we know what most people need at this point. OK, so let's fast forward a year to the Horizon 2 release. This was the famous captive core release. In a nutshell, this release is all about simplifying Mary Kondo style. The core team and the Horizon team worked closely together to think to find a way to run a lightweight stellar core, uh, a core whose only job was to feed Horizon the metadata that it needed. It turns out that such a beast can run entirely in memory. Uh, that means it's stateless. And because it's only used by Horizon, the process can be controlled from Horizon 2. This stellar core doesn't do uh, SCP or validation or anything like that. Its only purpose is to read, to watch the blockchain, read from it, and then unpack metadata for Horizon. This also had the cool advantage that configuration got simpler because most of the necessary core parameters could be provided or inferred by Horizon. So from the point of view of an operator, things got a lot simpler. There's no Stellar Core database anymore. Now you can do an app get install of your Horizon package onto your Ubuntu server. You have your uh, Horizon instance with a Horizon database and then a Stellar Core process that Horizon manages and that's it. So a lot simpler. The really big win though, the one I was most excited about was parallel catch up. So to understand parallel catch up, we have to go back a bit and, and remember the, the world before this. Before Horizon 2, there was a problem. If you were a Horizon operator and you decided you wanted to bring online a Horizon with full history, uh, one that could answer any question all the way back to the Genesis ledger, it turns out that was not easy. To build that Horizon database, and all of that data, a Stellar Core must replay and apply every transaction from every ledger that has ever happened. Before Horizon 2, this was a very, very slow process. It could take weeks, in fact, to get up to date. You can imagine that this is problematic not only for new users who uh, you know, want to get started on the Stellar network, but also for existing users who would be uh, justifiably worried if something bad happened to their data, they could spend four weeks or six weeks trying to uh, get their stuff back online. So that was a big headache for uh, all full history Horizon operators. So Horizon 2 provides this dual innovation. First of all, not only is Captive Core thousands of times faster at generating ledger metadata than a traditional Stellar Core, it turns out you can also run such a Captive Core in parallel. The history of the blockchain uh, is uh, individual ledgers, and the ledgers do not depend on one another from the point of view of ingestion. That means that you can take the blockchain and chunk it up into ranges, thousands of ledgers at a time, and feed those ranges to Stellar Core. So now, the history of the blockchain can be divided and conquered by a small army of parallel Stellar Core nodes. This does require some significant compute resources to run all of those stellar cores at the same time, but 
you only need those resources for a short time, a day or two. After that, all of these parallel warriors can be dismissed and you're up to date. So this is a huge game changer to go from a month to a day or a day or two to get up to date. There's a huge, huge shift in the way we can think about the data and the, uh, how seriously we have to protect that data. So once you have that, all of that up to date, you can downspec the machine. You don't need an enormous uh, machine in AWS anymore. And you just run one stellar core and trickle feed going forward. OK, so what's next for Horizon? The most urgent problem that we have today is scaling how Horizon handles historical data. A modern Stellar Ledger is busier than any time in the past. And that's a good thing, good thing for everybody. But a full Horizon history is becoming uncomfortably large. But not all of that data, or even most of it, needs to be kept in a highly accessible Postgres database. The thing is that if you want to know what happened last year, you don't need to know all of that in a hurry. So recent and older data have different usage patterns and availability requirements. It's sort of an interesting place that we've come to. Horizon by default keeps all of the data in Postgres highly available, immediately able to answer any question from any point in time. But that's more a consequence of just the way things have evolved than uh, considered design. If you think about the actual use cases here, in general, when you want historical data, you don't have these uh, high availability requirements. So for example, if you are a wallet provider, you do need to have instantaneous information or as close to uh, current information as possible about payments, for example, because if a user of your wallet pays somebody, they'd like to see that that payment succeeded. On the other hand, occasionally your user will click on a, on a, a menu option or something, and they would like to see the history of their transactions. And that is not going to be uh, not going to happen every day. It's going to be a, a much more infrequent process. And once you have that historical summary of somebody's account, that history doesn't change. It's immutable. It will be added to as more transactions happen, but you don't need to go and find out again what happened three years ago. Finally, you could imagine a, a user once a year wanting to get tax information about their transactions, and they would want to have a historical query there. Um, but again, it doesn't have to come back immediately. These things don't have the same sensitivity on time. So there's a common pattern in API design implemented by many big organizations, which is to have older and newer API data, data streams. So we're looking at this pattern as well. We're looking at ways for Horizon operators to provide historical data more cheaply through batch APIs with potentially slower response times. This is a way for us to keep Horizon itself performant and snappy for the quick, urgent queries, but provide a way to get all of the information when we need it. Another interesting idea that we've been thinking about is to break up the problem of data. And there are several different dimensions we can think about. We already have the dimension of time. If you install a Horizon instance, you can have uh, full history or 90 days of history, or 30 days of history, or no history at all. So we already allow users to configure how much data to store by time. But there are some other interesting uh, axes here. How about location or endpoint? So let's talk about these in turn. The first thing is, if we have limited data by time in our horizon, what happens if we occasionally need to ask for something older? To take the wallet example that we were describing a minute or two ago, um, we have a situation where uh, most of the time we only need current data. So we might configure our horizon to just the last 30 days. But occasionally, we need a year of data or even more. Well, the idea of federated search is interesting here. This is the idea of a tree of Horizon instances that can fall back up the chain as needed when requested data is not locally available. So imagine that you ask your local Horizon for data and that Horizon doesn't have all the data. Right now you get a 404 from the Horizon server. In the future, what could happen is that Horizon could 
proxy your request up the chain to a, a horizon that it knows does have the historical data and then return a response to you transparently. That's a pretty cool idea. It reduces the load on the full history servers. It treats your local horizon as a kind of cache, but it's transparent for your user. So this is an idea we're interested in, we're thinking about. Another idea here is configurable endpoints. So thinking about these dimensions, most horizon operators only make use of a few endpoints, but there are dozens of endpoints in horizon. And in order to fund all of those endpoints and fill them with data, we have to store all the data. So we can imagine a future where you configure your horizon instance based on what you need to know for your business case. And that makes the total stored data a thin slice of history rather than all of history. It's going to be much, much smaller. So let's say that you're an asset issuer and you only care about the assets that you issue. Instead of tracking all the thousands of assets on the Stellar network, you track the five or six assets that you've issued. And your tables are much smaller, but you can go back further in time and have full visibility of the history of those assets. So these are just ideas at present. They're not concrete plans. I'm not promising that we're going to do them. But they, hopefully they give you a flavor of the kind of things we're thinking about as we move into this brave new world of uh, even more uh, traffic and uh, value being moved on the Stellar network. The final thing I want to really mention is the potential that's inherent in the ingestion library. Remember back to Horizon 1.0, we abstracted this heavy lifting machinery uh, from Horizon and made it available as a standalone library. This library is really powerful. It's actually really exciting to imagine a future where the community gets involved and builds interesting new tools and interfaces on top of this ingestion machinery. We've written some tutorial guides that you can have a look at. And as we show in those docs, in just a few lines of code, you can write bespoke integrations that read what you care about and output to whatever format you can imagine. So for example, you can create a reader using this ingestion library. You can configure that reader to filter for whatever you care about. Maybe it's an account or a set of accounts, or maybe it's an asset, or, or maybe it's a certain kind of operation, or maybe it's all of the above. You set the filter up and it starts to sit there listening to the network. And then as these events happen that you're interested in, they show up as streamable pieces of JSON. And now you can just convert them into whatever you like. Would you like to store them as CSV files, flat files, dump them to a log, put them on Twitter, send them to Slack, send them to your own database or your own internal architecture. All of this is possible, it's very open. You could even write your own uh, alternatives to Horizon, GraphQL, uh, different RESTful APIs. Um, we really think that this is a powerful enabler for innovation. In the future, I hope, that there might be a set of such tools, a range of APIs and services that would form a kind of marketplace for access to Stellar. This would be a huge win for decentralization and for innovation in our space. Instead of just being one gateway to the network, there could be many gateways. Horizon will continue to be here. We're not going anywhere. We're going to continue to support the ecosystem's core use cases uh, and evolve Horizon to, to be that thing for what people need. But in the future, there may be many gateways, and many paths to building lean, mean applications on Stellar. So I'll end this short talk by pointing out that you can find out more about many of the topics that we touched on today. Please check out our docs, our tutorials, and join the conversation with us on our mailing list and on GitHub. Um, there are some links here, and if you go and search for these, items, you can find out how to build your own ingestion uh, toy project, for example, and get involved. Um, there'll be some uh, time to ask questions uh, down below after this. So please ask away. Thank you. <laughs>